devices in, in the operator's business. And I think, to my knowledge, AT&T is the only one that breaks out connected devices separate category in terms of units. Do you think uh, we'll get to a point where operators will start breaking it down by revenue as well? Well, I think what happened was the operators were breaking it out in a couple stops. Yeah. And I think you stop for obvious reasons. You want to break out something you don't want to talk about. Um, we break ours out. We have from the beginning we made that commitment to our shareholders because we see this as such a growing area that the transparency is most important in making sure. So every single quarter we break out our connected devices. What he doesn't like is that we don't necessarily break out the revenues. And one of the reasons we don't is our connected devices land in multiple buckets. So what we call merging devices is postpaid, prepaid, host sale, as well as session based or prepaid. So we look at it so many different ways that we just talk about the numbers and we kind of don't necessarily show all the revenue. I think people will. I mean, I think you're going to have to. I mean, a lot of the growth coming is coming in tablets. It's coming in what Jeff talked about. That's a big part of the growth that's coming in. So it's going to be very hard. But right now, for competitive reasons, we decided to stick, stick with. We show the widgets and we don't talk too much more about it. You know, Verizon was showing it stops so and they're not going to show it anymore. Sprint stopped. I'm not sure what T-Mobile is up to. So. And, uh, Verizon announced their um, kind of data share plans. Uh, 18 days talked about it, uh, that it's, uh, it might be coming. Do you see that has an impact on the connected device segments, especially in the consumer, consumer market? Yeah, I think it does. I mean, I think, going back to what Jeff said, the stars are aligned. I mean, you know, people ask all the time, so why now? What's happened? Obviously, the penetration has made the carriers very excited about it. Our networks are there. The cost of modules has come down. So when you look at every aspect of it, the next aspect is, is rate structures. Um, the iPad, which you said was going to be good on AT&T, which I, I believe you, I guess. Um, basically, uh, we, we launched with session-based. We decided to go prepaid only for a reason, because customers told us that they thought that was fair. And when you look at our customer satisfaction on iPad, it's the highest customer satisfaction device we've ever sold. So I think when you start talking about family or shared plans, now we have not made any announcements, Verizon has. When you look at the opportunity to share a bucket, whether consumer, whether small business, obviously I think that helps us. I think that is a natural step. And Ralph has said that. Uh, we've talked about the fact we're looking at it. Again, we have not made an announcement. But I do think it takes the right step for a lot of the devices on my little water wheel there. You know, would it make it easier if you just add that to your bill for a couple bucks a month or for whatever? I think it would. I think Consumers would love that. So we're obviously still looking at it. Thanks. Jeff, you had a number of examples. Uh, I was curious about which vertical segments are you seeing the most traction in with respect to the units sold and, and revenue generated? Sure. So uh, one, one of the areas certainly you know, Lynn talked about is uh, security and home automation. The security side, both on the consumer and on the business, uh, there's a large drive in order to rip out your POTS lines. And uh, uh, in order to do that from a security perspective, in many places there, there are regulations which require that there be an alternative channel for communications. And so that's why there's a huge growth relative to uh, wired to wireless and, and uh, having not only a broadband connection in your home to be able to transmit back, but then also have a backup channel which is uh, through the cellular network. And uh, we have about a half a million devices that we have on, on, uh, on our network related to uh, uh, security in those applications. Uh, the other area that, that uh, is uh, uh, very interesting is in supply chain and logistics. And right now it's pretty simple. There's a lot of uh, things from a, a, a small fleet and even medium and large fleet kind of, kind of thing. But now what's going on is, is you're finding that as the module prices drop and you have the capability to be able to do things like sell ID with reasonable indoor location, which is driven by 911, all of a sudden, and along that with uh, you know the Wi-Fi network, for instance, that AT&T is building out is spectacular, and the databases that are available, uh, and in fact, the idea of uh, using crowdsourcing in order to source these databases, machine crowdsourcing. So a machine is traveling down the highway, and it's registering all of these SSIDs and Wi-Fi spots to be able to know. Uh, the relationship between those Wi-Fi spots and a, a, a geolocation. And so now all of a sudden, the next time you travel down that, 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 that place, you're going to know where you are. And you can do that with less power than you might have done trying to find a GPS or within the container or within the truck. And so the applications of supply chain and logistics as you move from just the capability to be able to find a truck on a road and you have the access to a GP, GPS, to have the capability to do the same thing inside buildings and inside warehouses becomes really fascinating. 
then I think the third area is uh, as you know the pig goes through the python, and we have this this uh, huge uh, thing relative to uh, the baby boom generation. You have uh, healthcare. In terms of how the radios split uh, on your modules, can you give a sense of uh, you know, what percentage you say cellular versus Wi-Fi versus uh, satellite? Well, it, in our business, most everything's across the cellular network. We have about 10% of our, our connections through uh, the satellite network. We're doing a lot more in hybrid. You know, and, and what's interesting about hybrid is, is you really need to tune the network elements relative to the application for hybrid to work right. So, for instance, uh, you may have a device which has the ability to be able to do Wi-Fi and cellular. And so what you really want is you want the capability to do a SIP registration on your HLR. That was, I did that for the geeks out in the audience because we hadn't done that. Before. Okay? And so you do a SIP registration on your HLR and you're able to optimize whether or not you're talking on the Wi-Fi network or you're talking on the, uh, um, the cellular network. Then um, you, you launched uh, Digital Life recently. Uh, Verizon ended up buying used tel telematics. Do you see the business of uh, being an operator is changing or morphing in, in some shape or fashion? Or is it just a natural evolution of the business? Well, I think I can only speak for us. Uh, and I think, as I said when I was talking earlier, you know, innovation is critical to the big care. Right? You know, you go back four or five years and we were all about, gosh, we want to get more smartphones to your contracts, life's pretty good, right? And then I think what's happened is, is we've all had to look in the mirror and say, how, how are we going to grow? Right? And, and really, when you talk, this, this topic we're on today is, is actually perfect because that is where that growth opportunity is. You know, I, when we were at CTIA and we talked, we launched Digital Life, I got asked, I mean, uh, my, my PR person in the audience, and I did like 40 interviews, I think, that day. Um, but everyone, you know, how does this fit? You know, why, why would AT&T go into the security and automation business? And I said, well, you asked that same question when we launched Ubers. No one asks us, asks us more why you're in the TV business. And so I think when you look at that, that business, it is absolutely, you know, perfect synergy with what we're trying to do, right? You're going to live your life on a wireless device. Your home is central to you, right? I think your home is the most personal and central to you. And so when you look at an industry like that, it would make perfect sense for us to go in an industry, like I said, that is really splintered, not a lot of technology growth, a lot of companies collecting checks, right? Because you're all paying them. I saw a lot of hands go up. And I mean, what are you really getting? And so, yeah, I think the carriers have to be, we believe, and I'll speak for Randall, our, our, our chairman, and Ralph, we, they are very aggressive at how do we go find new businesses and grow. Um, and I think it's exactly what we're doing. You know, the uh, things that Jeff hit are dead on right as to that's exactly where we have to look at all these places. The other fun part is everybody else in the ecosystem, I think you'd agree, is finally there. I mean, they're looking at this too, whether you could go to walk into it. Who here went to CES this year? You know, CES was the wireless CES, wasn't it? Like, I mean, since when was there car, car guys filled up the place because it was all about wireless? You know, even Gary Shapiro, who runs that show, came out and said, this is like the wireless show, and it is, because everything's about mobility. So as a carrier, if we're not taking advantage of that, if we're not being good partners, we're crazy, and that's what we have to do. Jeff, you, you showed uh, the medical device. What kind of regulatory hurdles do you have to go through uh, to get that device to the market? Well, yeah, it, it is ugly, and, and it's always going to be ugly. But uh, you know, yeah. the, the ones that are, are particular, sorry, the ones that are particular to uh, uh, the wireless arena that are even uglier are things where you have both short range wireless and long range. And this particular application was only long range wireless, so it's a little bit easier. When you have interacting between short range wireless and long range wireless, uh, it, it becomes even more complicated from a certification standpoint. And then from, in, in addition to that, when it's on the body, there's additional regulations relative to uh, both FCC and FDA. Yeah, we can uh, sit here, I, I can go online to, <laughs> these two speakers, but I wanted to get uh, some of the audience. My question is, uh, where do you see more traction in healthcare monitoring or uh, helping the physicians? Yes. Well, so look, and I think I'll, I'll, take, I'll take one side and I can let Jeff can jump on the other. I think when you look at healthcare, uh, the biggest issue we have right now is 10,000 right, baby boomers retire a day. And that's not going to stop. And so when you look at the ecosystem, we can't, our ecosystem can't support that. And there's all kinds of great stats out there about what's going to happen. How many, how, I mean, I've got parents that are retired, living in Arizona, that are aging, and the, 
you know, one of the things we learned very quickly as we started to look into that, that whole space is the first question you should ask your parent or grandparent is what's their biggest fear? What do you think it is? Be forced out of their home. Biggest fear. By the way, the people, the caregivers' biggest fear is that too because then they get to write a check for about 50000 bucks a year wherever that parent ends up. So we look at it as this. We can go back to the home. The ability for people to stay in their homes longer is, is a gift. Right, it's a huge opportunity. With the technology I'm talking about that we're launching, that's dead in the middle of what we want to do. We want to give you as a caregiver the ability to check in on mom or dad. The ability to see if they're taking their medication. The ability to see if the oven's on too long. The ability to see and understand so they can stay in their home longer. We also want to use some of the devices that Jeff was talking about because reality is, is if that device works in the home, there's absolutely no reason why it shouldn't be wirelessly enabled as well so they can leave the home. The device that Jeff showed is a wonderful example uh, where we have talked to tons of people out there who are home right? Because they have to be monitored all the time. They can't leave their house. So we have the technology to give them a wonderful experience in the home with a digital live hub. And then the second they walk outside, using the same right customer experience, using the wide area network, we give them that same experience. Now, by the way, that also helps the doctor or the other part of your question, right? So now they can do things differently than they've done in the past. Okay, so that can go on and on and how Wireless will make healthcare more efficient. Wireless will give people a better overall life. And wireless can also help us with some things that are going to hit us pretty soon that right now we're not in a position to handle in the U.S. If you want to ask something, what do you say? <laughs> so, essentially, the question is that I'll hear up and uh, how do you go about managing devices that might not be certified by ATT? Sure. So, uh, one of the things that I'm, I'm proud of is that uh, in October, we, along with Etsy, at the same time, we both published a standard uh, relative to MDM, and particularly around the architecture and defining the elements and defining the interfaces. And uh, that, that leads to protocols to be able to know what the protocols are. And at the device side, you know, we have some standards that, uh, that uh, the, the, the AT command sets to be able to control modems, for instance, are, you know, relatively straightforward. Uh, there's uh, standards that uh, have been thank goodness, uh, in the mobile environment, for doing firmware over the air and device management. There's billions of phones that are currently being managed using the Open Mobile Alliance device management standards. There's a lightweight protocol of that, an HTML version of that, that actually can be deployed in, uh, in relatively small, uh, incapable uh, uh, M2M devices. Another standard that I would, if I were you, you know, stay up on is uh, 6 Lopan. Capability. In fact, 6 Lopan has been adopted into the Zigbee standard now in version 2. And I was on the Zigbee consortium for a while. And, you know, Zigbee is one of the short range protocols that enables things like, you know, home automation and industry automation and other things. And the 6 Lopan uh, capability really provides us an IP method to be able to, and when he says it's a full IP network, that in fact is how you enable that. And the capability to be able to have an IP address that's all the way down to the sensor level. And to have as many of those as you need, we're running out of IPv4 space. In fact, it's going to sleet us now. Uh, there, there's, there's some standards. You kind of you move up the food chain. There's a lot of standards now. They're not. Uh, they're, they're probably going to become more of de facto standards and necessarily standards from standards bodies. But these standards have to do with the middle layer elements and be able to speak to uh, what are, you may not currently think of as a network element. And that may be, for instance, a network element is the capability to be able to do geofencing. But it does it a lot of it, and it does it very rapidly, and it does it for very strange fences, like ones that go along highways, to know whether a, 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 a vehicle that was carrying high value goods got hijacked. But the standards to be able to do a web service to find out a location and be abstracted away as a web programmer as to whether or not that location came by via Wi Fi hotspot or via cell ID or via GPS is very important because then you have the capability to be able to have the ecosystem focus in on the things that they do well, and then you get economies of scale. That drives down price and increases adoption. Yeah. All, all I'd add is, very well done by the way, Jeff. All I'd add is, is standards need to come from us. So I want to make up my commercial. We don't need any more help. The government wants to help us do everything, right? We need standards from the industry, from guys like Jeff, from us that say, this is going to help us be more efficient, do things better, not make things more expensive and more difficult. So that's my first message. Second part of this is, look, we have 100 plus million people on our network. Um, majority of those devices ended up coming through a lab of ours that we sold. On the emerging device side, I have a specific lab in Austin that does all my certification for my devices. 
We have a lab, a different lab that does smartphones and other things. Um, but as a wireless carrier, a GSM wireless carrier, we have to be really more um, concerned about a device that comes on and can harm our network. And so we put in the ability to see that, understand that, and make sure that we can go turn that device off. Um, we can't, at the front end, we don't control it, we know we can't. Um, people all the time, I buy a device overseas, and you know, come on, put our SIM card, it works. I love when they call care and I want to know why it doesn't work well, that's a different discussion. But point being is, is that's part of what a carrier does. And, and you know, we're a worldwide standard carrier. I think we're doing a better job as an industry with certification around the world becoming more consistent. Um, in fact, we're talking about that around the digital home, around as we go out and license our platform around the world, how do we help make it more efficient to have some standards in the home, such as the Zigbee he's talking about, the Z-Way, and make sure that that's simplified for the whole industry as we go forward. But again, I'll, I'll, really important that we in the room decide what standards are important. We bring in the right people and we make those decisions. I don't get a lot of help from other places. There are a number of developers in the room. Um, how should developers think about the opportunity in connected devices? Well, I think, I, you know, in fact, I was at Rutberg this week. I spoke on Monday in San Francisco, and, was, and the person meeting was all about developers. Look, developers today think smartphones, and, and you should, right? There's lots of opportunity, wonderful opportunities. The next question is, what OS, what OS should I develop from? Right? Everybody says, well, iOS and Android, uh, Windows, not so sure. Don't say that too fast. Um, I think what you have to think about is, is the growth is, is really the Internet of Things. It's all the different things that are going to be connected out there that can take and a developer, an apps developer, can go win with. Why wouldn't you develop for the car? Well, today you go, wow, well, I don't know what protocols are in the car. Well, you will see more and more OEMs coming out with SDKs, right? So I think the question really is, is what don't you develop for, number one? I know it's hard when you're a small player. You've got to take the winner so you can make some money. And we need to make it easier for you. And I, I think most of you know ATT has one of the best developers programs out. We won all kinds of awards on our developers program, and we do it under one simple idea is to be a great partner with developers. Right? What APIs do you need? We open up APIs all the time. How can we help you? And our job is to make sure as we dive into this immersive device space that we start to include more screens that you can develop, develop on. And that's our goal right now is to include all these different things. I will tell you that in the digital life business, if anybody in here is in the consumer electronics business, we are going to put out an SDK. We are going to allow anybody who wants to build and have their device certified on our network so when you walk into that home, it automatically recognizes if you can configure it. We're going to put that out. We'll give you a date that the plan is, is to make that as open as possible so everybody, anybody can build devices for our, for our platform. Jeff, are you doing anything to uh, enable the developers uh, that are built for your devices? Sure. You know, it's hard. Right now, it's really hard. And uh, But I can remember back when I first started developing, I worked for a company called Call Computer in 1974, and it was hard back then. We were doing writing games. One of the ones I rewrote was called Hunt the Wumpus. You guys remember the old HP 1000 computer? But in that particular case, it was hard. It was hard to figure out the communications that occurred to the mainframe computer that were coming back. And then nowadays, look at it, you know, 30 years later plus, and all of a sudden we've got World of Warcraft where you have millions and millions of users that are interacting and developing and in, you know, additions to this uh, this particular gaming uh, capability because the protocols are simple and easy and they're standards. Okay, so when they become simple and easy and standardized, then the developers will be able to abstract themselves away from the problem of getting the just getting the data stupid and work on the optimization problems, which will have a huge value. So I'm from Seattle, um, and I can pass the opportunity to ask uh, what do you think of uh, Microsoft Surface? What? What are you talking about? <laughs> uh, all right. So, look, uh, where do I start? First of all, Microsoft Service is great. Uh, the, only, the only issue I have is they didn't, they, they're going to launch a Wi-Fi only, which is like launching a smartphone Wi-Fi only. But bottom line is, is this. Um, Windows 8, we are huge proponents. Uh, the, and you saw the announcement on Windows Phone 8. Um, obviously, you know, we're very excited about the tablet business. We're very excited about uh, Mr. Ballmer and his team are diving into this really hard. Um, we've been working with them very closely. Uh, when you look at, I get asked all the time, what's the third OS? I hope there's 28 OSs. You know, I've got to remember, I'm a carrier. As long as you guys are happy with my stuff and use my network, I'm happy. And innovation always drives, right? Competition drives, innovation drives, drives, drives. So what we're seeing at Windows 8, and 
anybody seen it, go on YouTube, you can kind of take a look. It is very, very exciting. And what's also exciting about it is I, I got a chance. We have a big forum for CIOs, our largest uh, ABS or B2B customers. And I presented to, the, to these individuals, and it was really clear. They said, look, as a CIO in today's environment, I don't want to buy three devices for my employees. I don't want to buy a smartphone, a tablet, and a, and a, and a PC. I want to buy a smartphone and a tablet. And I really believe Windows 8 is one of those, it's going to be one of those opportunities to buy one device. Right? Now we can all debate whether it's ARM or x86 and all that. Bottom line is, is the competition is phenomenal. And, and if you look at the Surface device, it, it, is, it is very, very nice. I think it's, again, going to drive the innovation and competition that we need to continue to, uh, to see things move forward. So I'm excited about it. I haven't touched it yet, you know, I've, but uh, I'm looking forward to playing with it. And, uh, and, uh, yeah. It's great to have Microsoft in the game. Great to Microsoft. We're very happy to hear that. Uh, well, I think that's all the time we have. Are there other questions? Okay. If, if you were to compare what's going on with connected devices today to some event in the past, whether it's in business or in sports or in media or you name it, what would you compare it to and why? I, I, I've got an answer. Oh, go ahead. So the question is, uh, how have uh, past and current um, uh, connected devices different or changed? Sure. I, I, I compared to something that happened recently. So, so let me ask a question, a little quick quiz. What happened basically almost exactly five years ago? What launched? iPhone. The iPhone. Right? When the iPhone launched, it was a 2G iPhone for 600 bucks and a bunch of new bought it. Right? And the bottom line is, is the world changed, right? Because Apple leaped so far past everybody else. And I apologize to all the OEMs. I love them. They're good buddies of mine. The bottom line is, is the best smartphone, or the best smartphone back then was a Blackberry. Second best was a Palm. Anybody have a Palm? You have to pull the battery about every four minutes because it froze. It was thought it was good to us. Um, bottom line is, they changed the world. And we saw what happened. We saw a very, very low smartphone penetration to, I believe last quarter, the industry, about 50 plus percent of the devices sold were smartphones. And I, I, I liken it to that. We're seeing this unbelievable way hitting us that he's working on every day, I'm working on every day. You're finally starting to see everybody in the ecosystem getting what we're going to see in five years from now. We'll be sitting here at this conversation. It'll be a very different conversation. It's actually already two years from now, it'll be a very different conversation. But that wave that we saw, to me, is almost identical to what we're going to see. You think it'll still be Apple or uh, somebody else? Yeah, I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> no, uh, I, I actually, look, Apple's doing a great job. And Apple's got a phenomenal market share. And, and obviously, Tim and the team continue to, to amaze. Um, but they're driving so fast and so far that other people are going to continue to try. Android's done a, a nice job. Obviously, that team's done well. Like we said, I think you're going to see a lot of people trying to, to get at Apple. And look, Apple has proven that they're one of the most innovative companies ever. And uh, I wouldn't bet against them, but I'll also would tell you that there are other people that are coming on fast. I, I like your question. I, I would answer it differently, uh, only from a technical standpoint. I think it's comparable. In 1976, I had an MSI 8080. It's on the front cover of Popular Electronics Magazine. It was the first microcomputer. And what was interesting about that back then was that it changed the way people thought about computing. And the, the phenomenon that's going to occur with this, you know, success is when you don't know it's there. And what happened with the personal computer was that all of a sudden it became very prevalent from a consumer standpoint, and everybody had one. But then what was really successful was the fact that you've got probably 25 to 30 microprocessors working in your car right now, and you don't think about it. So the embedded capability uh, of the microprocessor invention in 1974 to today is, I think, comparable to what's happening within embedded wireless. Because right now, we have to think about it too much. And what's going to happen is it's going to be embedded in our lives, and we're not going to be thinking about it anymore. We're going to look back at this time going, Wow, that's, that's incredible. Back then, Dad, you had to do what? <laughs> I had to hold down these two buttons and for a long time until this little thing started turning. <laughs> Thank you.
Uh, well, uh, please join me in uh, thanking our wonderful panelists.